Hola Flamingos, this is Andrew Mark Rowe and you are currently breathing in Holy Flamingo Poop. Today we on the show we have John Dobbin, fellow Newfoundland genre fiction author. John has written a few things, namely The Starving, The Risen, The Broken Spire, and Ghosts of Crimson Hollow, as well as several uh, short stories that have been published through Engine. Is there any other uh, publisher you went with? Um, any short story? Ghosts of Crimson Hollow. No, no, no short stories, but Ghosts of Crimson Hollow is with Raven Tail Publishing. Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, thanks for coming on, John. This is our second crack at an interview. The first one didn't work out due to some technical difficulties, and it's about a year for us to get this back on track. Um, and it was a different podcast. Yeah. Um, so this it's going to be a little bit different um, than the last time, um, but I still want a little bit of background um, about you. So you're from Newfoundland? I am from Newfoundland. Whereabouts? I'm from... Um... Well, technically St. John's, Newfoundland, but I grew up in the Ghouls just outside of, New uh, just oh. outside of St. John's. Okay. A ghoul again. Yeah. Ghouls are wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I kind of want to get a little bit of um, background about your writing. Um, so when did, how did you get your start writing? Because I think you, you started off with Engine uh, in a contest. Is that right? Is that how it went? Uh, yeah, that's, that's when I really started being professional i guess in the sense that i was getting paid for writing was with engine i uh we took i took part in a, a 48 hour writing marathon and i came i tied for first place um in that where the prize was that the engine would uh, publish the novel that you were working on i didn't get like a full novel written in 48 hours, but the part that they saw, they really enjoyed. And so went from there. And that was the beginning of The Starving, my first book. Okay. And you say that was when you started doing it professionally. So then I take take it from that, that you, um, you've been doing this for a period of time before then. Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been writing for years. I mean, I think most writers out there would say that they've been writing since they were younger, since they were kids. And I mean, I'm one of those. I did uh, do a few writing courses in university when I was there, and it really kind of got me into writing some short fiction stuff, more literary-based stuff, which is the opposite of what I do right now with genre fiction. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I did a lot of writing in university. Kind of took a break from it after that because getting jobs and, and taking care of family was uh, the priority, and I got back into writing for pleasure and becoming a professional, um, I don't know, about 2014, 2015. Okay, cool. Um, and you, you, you said you were doing literary fiction and, um, obviously the, um, starving is a horror story. Um, yeah. so how did, how did that, how did that switch happen? Well, I always loved genre fiction, but, um, and this is probably a longer conversation to have at some other time, but, uh, university, uh, kind of the best wording, they kind of more focus on the literary aspect of it. Um, things that you're going to study for years on end, trying to find meaning in it and things like that. And so I kind of had to adapt my writing to meet those needs in that setting. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was just a good way to, you know, add tools to the tool belt, really, more than anything else. Uh, because I do, like I said, really enjoy genre fiction, uh, specifically horror and westerns and western horror, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, looking at it from the literary kind of point of view gives you a, a few more things that you can do, a bit of a different look at how to write, so... It's a bit, it's, it's interesting. Well, let me ask you this. This is something that's kind of a, <clears throat> it's certainly a point that every author has to consider, I think, you know, how do you, how do you define the difference between genre fiction and literary fiction? It's a hard one, you know, um, because to me, there's not, not much difference really, because literary fiction do genre as well. Like for instance, um, 
a local author, Lisa Moore, who's considered uh, literary fiction, has been up for a Giller Prize, you know, a few different times. Mm -hmm. uh, well heralded here in Newfoundland as as a good writer and um, has done a lot of literary fiction, edited a bunch of collections, that kind of thing. Um, she did a book a little while ago called Flannery, which is a um, young adult kind mm -hmm. of romance. Yeah. Um, and so that's genre, right? That's a genre of fiction right there. But she used her literary fiction way of writing it. So it mm -hmm. is a hard way for me to look at it. Um, I, I personally can't tell the difference a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a more negative version of me would probably say that um, they're trying to be a little bit too different. Like they try and play literary fiction tries to play a little bit with the rules of writing, you know, mm -hmm. um, whereas genre fiction sticks within the rules more closely, but they focus on different aspects of mm -hmm. the rules. Yeah. So, for instance, I know a, a few literary uh, writers, not all of them, uh, don't use quotation marks when they write. Their okay. speech is still there. And you can still figure it out, but it takes a second longer just because they're not using the quotation mark. That's part of their writing style. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny that you bring that up because I had like, I don't read much literary fiction anymore. When I, I did when I was in uh, university. And, and, you know, I think that there is a, um, to me, like the, the distinction came up as a marketing thing, I, I suspect. Like, that's kind of what the way, the only way I can really understand it because you know, it's easier for somebody to market something when you say this book is like this book. And, you know, that's kind of the beginning of a genre. But uh, I did, I, I've just found out about this, like, because I, I think there is like, you know, I know there's a bit of some different usage, like between like English books, like I read uh, Terry Pratchett, and he uses a single quote uh, for quotations by the, rather than the double quotes that we normally use um, yeah. in in uh, Canada, the US. Um <clears throat> Yeah, that's it's an it's an interesting uh, question, I think. Um, but I mean, you know, and it's 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 hard to kind of like you know put define yourself in a genre too. Like you know, I like I re I've read all of your stories, and you know, I think that there's like um, you got a certain style of writing. That, and I think every writer has this kind of thing. Like, it's like you get into it and it's like, okay, this is, you know, you read about, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 pages and you kind of get in, okay, I get the feel of this um, type of, uh, you know, what, you know, it's just like, yeah, exactly a style type of thing. But I suppose there's more, you know, if you're looking at horror, like there's, I, I, like, I feel like with literary fiction, unless you're talking about something magical realism, like, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez is mm -hmm. one. Um, but you know, that kind of like thing where there's a little bit of magic, it, like, you know, it's not quite, it's not quite Tolkien like, in terms of like, fa like the fantasy, fantastical elements, but it's kind of, kind of there on the edge. Um, like I, like I look at Neil Gaiman stuff and I could say, you know, his, his is fantasy, but I could also see it being categorized as literary, um, mm -hmm. to some extent, you know? Well, um, I mean, that's what's funny because a lot of times they will, um, like, especially in the university setting, I should say, because what they'll do is they'll look and they'll study these stories um, or these these books and they'll be like, oh, this is a literary work of art, you know, that kind of thing. So, for instance, Faust, um, mm. that play about yeah. a man who makes a deal with the devil. That's a that's a horror story. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's studied as literary, you know, like that's a that's a literary this. We can learn so much from this. This is a great piece of art. You know, yeah. not, you know what? That's genre. That's a horror. Yeah. And the same thing goes for anything Shakespeare, really. I mean, um, Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, what was that? Uh, no, not. Oh, I forget it. The one with Prospero in it. Oh, yeah. That's what I was thinking. It's not um, uh, The Tempest. Yes, is the it, Tempest. Yeah, Tempest. Yeah, yeah. Forgive me. I have a bad memory. But, um, but yeah, The Tempest, that has a bunch of different uh, fantasy elements in it. You know? yeah. There's an actual sorcerer in it. There's yeah. sprites, there's that kind of stuff. So, I mean, there's, it's, it's interesting the way the world has kind of split up writing, you know? Yeah. Um, and they continue to try and do that. Like, 
Yeah. Like if you look at genre fiction, that's a pretty broad term. Yeah. Right? There's romance, there's horror, there's westerns, there's um, science fiction, there's regular fiction, you know, like there's a whole bunch that's just underneath that. And then you get the ones that cross over, like the stuff I write, Western horror. So there's two yeah. different genres there. So, I mean, it's just it, yeah. it's weird that we have to label things like that. But Yeah. I, I mean, I from a personal level, I kind of have a, you know, my stuff is weird enough that it's like, I, I'm like, you know, and I, I get these like, um, you know, that it's hard to categorize. My like, editor says to me, he's like, this is like an Andrew Mark Rowe. Like, I can't really, mm -hmm. you know, it's got like these different things. And, uh, you know, I read the, or I do these like... Um, publishing um like it's like it's basically they get to get advice for like uh i think david gogren for for example he yeah. he talks a fair bit about like you got to write to market and you got to put it into a genre to some degree because otherwise it's hard to market these things which is you know i'm learning that the hard way i mean it's it's one of these things where i'm kind of like playing a long game on it but um yeah there's definitely like a, an element of that and you see it with like netflix and you know um movies and stuff and you know people say like oh this one's going for the oscar or this one is like you know whatever schlocky b horror movie you know that's a lot of fun but not like you know te technically might not be as perfectly done as something else right yeah i think that's i think you hit it right on the head that's kind of the def the difference between literary and genre genre is you know, well, literary, I should say, are the ones that are looking for those awards. You know, they're yeah. they're up there. They're critical. A lot of people really like them. You know, they make it to like Oprah's lists and yeah, yeah. all these book lists and CBC lists and stuff like that. Um, whereas genre is there to entertain. Not to say that literary isn't entertaining because I love literary as much as anybody. It's just yeah. you know that's a more of a focus for for genre as opposed to the literary group. Yeah, I mean it's 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 interesting cuz I, I like I don't you know, I don't know how much I buy into this totally, but it's almost like there's like you you see class divisions in society and there's almost like this like class division within this art community essentially is what it is, right? Like cuz you know, I, like I remember cuz <clears throat> when I first was starting right, I wanted to make like the next great Canadian novel, quote unquote, you know, whatever. That's like the literary version of something, but it was like for me personally, it was like that didn't ring true to me. Eventually, I had to find something that was actually that was true, and that's like not gonna. It's not gonna be on the Giller shortlist. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, um, so okay. So in terms of your okay, here's here's what I want to talk to about your horror. Um, so you talked about horror, but what is your main literary horror influence? Like what or if you can think of like you know who are your the writers and books that yeah uh, you can think of that really influenced that I, I wish i had some like obscure kind of horror source that really influenced me but i'm probably going to be the typical horror writer who's going to say edgar Allan poe and stephen king you know yeah. those guys are the reason that i'm i'm writing horror the reason why i enjoy horror they're two of the best that have ever done it you know who's to say you know what way uh, who's who am I to not say that they helped me, right? Like they, they've mm. really been an influence on me. Um, I really enjoy their work. I got I got them tattooed on me. You mm -hmm. know, they're a big part of what makes me me and what makes me a writer. Yeah. So those are the two big ones. I mean, since then, I can name numerous different great horror authors who I've come across. Uh, Thomas Ligotti is one. He's more of a literary style horror and a little bit more abstract. He's great. Um, Lovecraft is in there, even though he's racist. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a couple, you know, like Stephen Graham Jones, who is a uh, Native American writer, and he's uh, done some really great stuff. He really focuses on slasher type mm -hmm. uh, books, which is great. Um, John Horner Jacobs, who is criminally, criminally um, not looked upon. He is a fantastic, fantastic writer. It, I picked up his book, A Lush and Seething Hell, and it's a it's two uh, novellas in one. And mm -hmm. his writing 
makes me cry. It's so good. Like it is amazing what he can write. Uh, then we have people like John Lanigan and, um, oh my goodness, I forget his name. Hold on a second. There's another guy, Laird, Laird Barron. Uh, okay. Both of those guys are really great. And Paul Tremblay, you know, all of these people are great and they make you want to write uh, better um, in this the horror kind of genre. And those are the guys that I really look up to and who I really want to kind of stick to. But I think just to go back to Stephen King, I was... I, Stephen King has wrote a lot of books. He's written a lot. And um, for a while there, I was really trying to play catch up with his books. And I found that I was just reading book after book after book of Stephen King, which is fine by me. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I really wanted to kind of widen um, my reading pool. Right? I wanted to read different. I wanted to see what other people are doing out there. Um, so I have it. That's what I've been doing every year. I kind of limit the amount of Stephen King books that I read. But I gotta say, every single time I come back to Stephen King, it's like he's welcoming me home. It's just he opens up his arms and he's gonna tell you a, a scary story, but you feel so comfortable just getting in there and you just want to devour the words. You just want to run right through it and get it done because you you love it so much. Yeah, I know. I I, I feel the same way about Stephen King. Like I, I he was a huge influence on me. I, I remember like in my early 20s, just reading book after book. I never read Lovecraft till later, um, and I love, love, love Lovecraft. He's, I think he's great. Um, but the, and I'll tell you, you know, you were, you were naming those horror authors, and you were talking about that guy, what was it, John Horner Jacobs? Yeah. Um, I had the ex exact same experience with Clive Barker and his Books of Blood. I don't know if you ever read those, but those are like the, the best um, horror, horror short stories I think I've ever read. I read his Hellbound Heart. Um, I've been meaning to get more to pick up on, but Barker is another. He's a great, yeah. great writer. Really yeah. good. Yeah. And those are like the, you know, those are, those are guys who are like masters of their craft. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're probably never going to be, um, you know, win any of the, well, they, but there's some genre fiction prizes. I shouldn't say never. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure um, they've all won, you oh, know, yeah, most of them. Like Ligotti, I know he, he won. Um, I can't remember what it was, but yeah. Um, yeah, there's there's some genre prizes that you win, but in terms of like the more mainstream stuff, you'd never yeah. hear these names. Um, okay, what about horror movies or video games? In terms of um, influences, I wouldn't put video games up there, even though I love playing uh, video games. I've been I'm a kind of a simple video game player for the longest time when i was in university i would just play like wrestling games you know like that kind oh, of yeah. They're good. mindless kind of <laughs> kind of game and fighting games like street fighter and stuff like that but movies definitely uh, are up there um i always loved the shining i i watched the shining before i read the book mm -hmm. and he i i think i probably watched the shining before i read any of stephen king's books yeah uh, and so i really liked that one um, I love slasher movies like Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween, all mm -hmm. of those kind of movies. Um, but I also like the kind of weird kind of out there movies like Event Horizon kind of. Oh, it's so good. So good. <laughs> Sci-fi horror. But it's also really yeah. weird. And yeah. um, Dark City was another one. Yeah, that's, that's a good kinda, one. Yeah. Kind of weird. Um, and recently uh, uh there's a movie that came out that really is in my wheelhouse it's called uh, antlers and it's okay. kind of about the windigo kind of uh i'll have to check that out legend yeah. it's not a great movie uh in terms of acting like the actors are a bit wooden but the yeah. character and in, in the horror or the creature design fantastic yeah. fantastic yeah. I got uh, i'm a got a shutter subscription i love whatever i, I don't know if you ever listened to watch um it's on Shutter. Joe Bob Briggs, like the, the last yeah. drive-in. <laughs> no. Oh, it's it's it's. If you ever if you ever um, check out Shutter, it's good to it's good to check because it's almost like he's like uh, narrating in these little pieces in between. He tells you like stories about it. He's like a huge fanatic, but um, yeah. Another couple that I, I forgot to mention. I was just thinking of them then. Uh, Predator and Alien and Aliens. Uh, those Predator, Predator Two, Alien, Aliens. Those were like 
Yeah. I love those. Those were like my Saturday morning cartoons when I was growing up, you know? Like, I really enjoyed watching those movies. And I don't write science fiction because I'm not, I just don't think I have that kind of writing in me. Yeah. But those are some fantastic movies that are just fun to watch. Yeah. I mean, Alien is like, I think I can see Alien's DNA in like so much horror since like as yeah. and even like video games like i don't think there'd be a resident evil if there was no alien like those that movie i think like it, it and or event horizon like you know it uh yeah really really awesome um alien is kind of like you took halloween or or friday the 13th and you made it more of an out art house film yeah it's a slasher yeah. in space. Like, if you really break it down, like, into the poorly described movie kind of thing that's been going around lately, it's a slasher in space. Yeah. But it's so, like, Ridley Scott, the director, does such a great job in directing it and building the horror and the, the tension in there that it really just takes it to the next level. Like, you, you wouldn't necessarily say that's a slasher. You know, you wouldn't put that in with, you know, Jason and Michael Myers, but... Well, it's just, I mean, it's like you got this weak, like the humans are like these weakly, like, you know, compared to the monster slasher or whatever, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's very, very it similar. It even has the sexual innuendos, especially in the first one. A lot of mm. sexual innuendos, which is a big thing in, in the slasher kind of thing, the slasher mm. films, you know. Well, that, that was H.R. Giger who did all the artwork and his stuff, like, has always been like this dark, weirdly sexual but like really messed up type of stuff um the uh bu- bu- f- okay here's one funniest book you ever read funniest book i ever read it's, that's a hard question for me because i don't read many funny books i really <laughs> focus on that stuff which sucks because i really gotta kind of open myself up to them so I think one of the funniest books I've read is an actual comedy book. Stephen Colbert's I Am America and So Can You. Um, Okay, I've read it, but I've I've seen it advertised. Yeah, and not only, and maybe not just that one, but Bruce Campbell's uh, If Chins Could Kill, (laughs) the movie actor. Oh, he's Um, good then. He's he's an entertaining kind of charming guy, and it's not meant to be like really a funny book, but it just you know it's entertaining throughout, and you kind of smile and laugh it throughout as well. Yeah, he's got his own thing going on, like the Bruce Campbell thing. It's really funny. I, I, have you seen the um, uh, Ash versus Evil Dead that show they made? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never <laughs> I was got so all of it yet, but they canceled it after three it's, it's like one of the funniest and like most compelling shows i was like yeah. i got to the end i was like this is i can't believe it's still going and it's this good yeah. and it's over but anyways <laughs> um okay you're going to mars and you need to take three books what would they be uh and you never books. get you never get any more books it's the desert island thing but mars yeah, but it's mars uh <laughs> salem is a lot yeah, um, would be my first one. A Lush and Seething Hell by John Horner Jacobs. Love it. Like, I can't stress how good that is. And probably this is going to be rough. Um, hmm. What else? Um, I'm going to say Charles Bukowski, Love is a Dog from Hell. Oh, he's nice. He's a misogynist and he's a bit of an arsehole and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Product of his time, but it's poetry. I want to kind of round out my, my choices. Well, he's like, I, I never read that one, but I read, uh, I think, Women and Factotum and Barfly, maybe. Uh, anyways, he's, he's like, I think you're right. I mean, it's like, he's like, right, like these picaresque type of things where he's like this like anti-hero like kind of doing stuff that's like so yeah. <laughs> brutal and actually he wrote yeah. a he wrote a book called pulp um and it's his, one of his novels that he wrote and it's a total send-up of raymond chandler's kind of detective noir fiction. oh i gotta check and that out and i love that stuff yeah. so uh, honestly that actually is probably one of the funnier books i read too because he really just eats alive 
Ch Chandler and his group. Uh, okay. Those, those types of uh, those types of fiction and those type of stories is really good. Okay, well, that reminds me because I, I, Stephen King, he wrote that book on writing. He said, if you want to get better at descriptive writing, read a lot of those types of books, the detective fiction. Was there anything that you like? And I did like I got the Glass Key and I got um, the Big Sleep and a bunch of other ones, and I read through them. Um, was there anything like that when you were like picking up writing that you were like, I got to read this to kind of get an idea how to do this? Um. You know what? I think I think you're right there. Those old pulpy kind of books, man. They they really pounded out some great description. Uh, the ones I went to, and I mean, I read Chandler as well, and he had some great stuff in there. Um, but there is Robert E. Howard stuff. Robert oh, E. Howard, yeah, that's good. Man. All yeah, that yeah, yeah. He uh, his collection on um, on Conan is just amazing. The yeah. description and stuff that he puts out there is really good. The pantherish thews. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cold blue eyes, square mane. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Um, okay, so uh, here's here's something that's a little deeper. Do you try to say anything about the human condition with your work? And I know that every book is different, but um, and if if so, what what are you you know? Without um, you know so showing how the sausage is made, uh, what is it and why? Um, I didn't try to do that in my first couple of books, just because you know I'm just trying to kind of get it out there, right? Mm -hmm. to write, not thinking about it. My more recent books, um, I'm still writing Western horror, so if you look at Western as kind of a, a genre on its own and and what it's trying to tell. It's really trying to tell the tale of how the world went from kind of no law, no no order, kind of just wild, to going into more civilized world. That's that's a lot, that's like the trope, you know, that's kind of the yep. thing that comes into it. And so I've kind of tried to do that a little bit in my recent books because the way I look at it is, um, yeah, you hear a lot now from different sides of the political spectrum, people saying, oh, I wish it could be like it was when I was younger. You know, we why aren't we doing this anymore? Why is this a thing now? And so I'm trying to really put it out there that, yeah, it really, you know, I have good memories, too, of when I was younger, of being there. But times change, things change, and if you can't change with them, then you're the problem yeah it, it's it's a, it's an interesting um it's almost like having blinders on you know yeah because like, you don't you don't like you know like if you go back to like the 60s say or something like you know like the uh, you know this would this would those were times where it was like race riots and like you know the you know things were quite a bit different in terms of like social justice and all this kind of stuff and yeah. you know like uh it's yeah it's an interesting um part of humanity to kind of like just focus on one thing and like completely like yeah yeah, yeah the focus you focus on yourself because i've been struck i hope it's not a midlife crisis or anything but i've been struck with kind of thinking about you know what man such a great time when i was a kid in the 80s you know like yeah. 80s and 90s that was the best time to be alive and i think about that but then I'm like, well, yeah, well, I wouldn't have a cell phone, you know, I wouldn't have disability, just like me and you here now. We're looking at each other over the internet, you know, that would be a little ways away. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be able to get all the information that I get to write what I'm writing, you know? Um, yeah. So there's a lot of things that would kind of hinder, you know, my life if I went back there. And this is speaking as a white person, obviously, who, you know, has privilege of being white. Um, yeah. And, and me saying, me saying, oh, I'm, yeah, and the dude, <laughs> yeah, I want to go back to the 80s and 90s. Well, that's a time that, you know, would be horrible for someone who was of any other race and of any other sexual orientation. You know, yeah. like, this would be a horrible time for them to go back to. And just imagine me having the audacity to say, no, no, who cares about that? I want to go back to when. I Make America happy. great again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You said it, 
10 year old you dreams of becoming a writer what advice do you give him my advice is probably going to be stolen directly from stephen king's on writing read and write read as much as you can read as broadly as you can and just write as much as you can every day try and sit down and write you don't have to write to be a writer you don't have to write every day to be a writer but if you can if you can write if you can find the time you're a step ahead yeah yeah i'd say it's in that that advice about the writing <clears throat> i got it from on writing and there was another book called the war of art by uh, stephen pressfield mm -hmm. and he like likens it to a war against resistance which is like the thing that's like tells you to play a video game instead of sitting down and writing or whatever like that um yeah there's that's like the best it's that's without a doubt the best advice and while you're when you get it when you're like starting out and you're like, I can't write shit. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And you're just yeah. like, well, this is never going to get any better, but you know, so it, somehow it, it happens, right? Like anything with practice. Yeah. Uh, um, so the starving, uh, your first book, that's an interesting take on the Wendigo myth. Although in your book, it's called the, uh, I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation. Mu way. Yeah. Mu way. Yeah. And what was your first encounter with the story? And, or, and do you have any any favorite adaptations of that story uh, or myth? My, the, the big secret behind the starving is, uh, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, I was a big fan of Predator growing up, and I really wanted to see what would happen if Predator went in the Wild West. Yeah, it's, and, it feels like Predator. It does feel like Predator. It's really good. Yeah, I have some like little hints and nods to predator in there um yeah. because it's a it was one of my big pieces of uh inspiration for it so i basically said all right i can't write predator into this because copyright yeah um what is something else i can do and so i started reading up on um different kind of monsters or beasts that would be around that time period or something that might be feared around that time period. I mean, Bigfoot's always there, but I, I find Bigfoot can kind of go either way. It can be really bad or really good. So mm -hmm. I wanted to find something that was mostly negative. And when I was doing my research, I found the version from the um, Delaware Indians um, called the, Len I'm going to butcher their, their name, the Len Lenape. Um, and theirs was the, and I can't say it either because I, I don't know, I got a lisp or something. Muay way. Yeah. Um, and it was just an interesting take on it. It's similar, it's pretty much the Wendigo. Yeah. Um, right there. But it just had, it was, it was different for me. And I wanted to kind of play with that a little bit more. Um, and I felt really bad about it afterwards because it's not my culture that I was playing in. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did approach our local, um, it's called First Light now, but it was re was called um, Native Friendship Center mm -hmm. in, in St. John's here. And I approached them about it with my project. Um, and they said, yeah, I mean, I don't think it would be a problem. You know, it sounds good. Are you, are you being racist? I'm like, well, there's a character in it who's awfully racist, but he gets murdered horribly. <laughs> Like he gets torn to shreds in like the worst way possible. And they were like, okay, yeah, that sounds, you know, as long as, and I was like, one of the main characters is an indigenous person and he is awesome. Yeah. Like, favorite character. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I did there. If I had my time back now, I probably would have reached out to the Lenape people, um, knowing a little bit more than I did at the time when I was just trying to write uh, yep. to, to ask them for permission to use those kind of terms and and words but otherwise I I just really like the idea of it so yep. I was like, okay predator in the wild west here's a here's a mythical beast or a mythological beast or a cultural belief mm -hmm. uh, that I can put in place of predator here and I worked around it that way yeah. I mean, to me, the the thing is kind of like a, um, you know, obviously it's multi-layered and this is just my observation. It seems like it's kind of like a 
admonition against um, eating people, uh, like because mm -hmm. the cannibalism is like kind of the thing that starts the whole transition or transformation into one of these creatures. And yeah. um, it's fun when I was doing. I came across this case. It's a famous case um, when I was going to law school, my first year of law school. I think it was, I think it was criminal law because basically it was called Dudley and Stevens, and it was a um, case where these people were. It was like early 1800s. They were off the coast somewhere. Something broke down on their vessel, and they had the abandoned ship, and they ended up in a lifeboat. And they were gone. They were for the for days. They were gone. And there's three guys left, and um, one of them passes out from starvation, essentially. He's not dead yet, but these other two murder him and eat him. And then a couple of days later, they get saved and they get charged with murder. And there was the question was whether or not um, <clears throat> whether or not necessity is a defense to a charge of murder like that. Because it's like, you know, basically they said, look, if we were, didn't eat him, we were going to die. Um, and so that's the decision we, we made. And... Um, and so the murder, so murder is the charge and death penalty is required. You're the judge. What do you do? Yeah. They're obviously guilty. What do, what do you do as the judge? This is just a thought experiment, mm -hmm. but I figured I'd see what you think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm no lawyer, but I, <laughs> I think you would have to take into account the extenuating circumstances, right? Yeah, a little bit there. But I think like you said, it's kind of a the the Wendigo kind of uh, tale kind of talks about how evil it is to do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And we know that there are actually uh, scientific things that happen to the body when you eat someone else, like it's not good for you. Yeah, uh, you, it makes you a little bit crazier. So uh, I'd say they're guilty. Yeah. What what, 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 what's the sentence though? Do you, do you, um, I'll tell you what happened. They, they did, they found them guilty. The jury found them guilty and they were charged with murder, but the judge, um, because of the outrage, because this was all over the news, everyone heard about it and everyone was kind of like, it's totally unjust that these guys should be killed. They were nearly died and they killed this guy and he was, he was dying. Like he was like out, like lost consciousness essentially. Um, from starvation and uh, the judge commuted the charge from murder to manslaughter and then with manslaughter he didn't have to um, he didn't have to give him the death penalty so they gave him six months in prison but it was like this thing where it was like yeah it was like this question was because it, this is the interesting thing about the law like it's easy to say like we write down all these laws in a book and this mm -hmm. is what what it is and then you get these like circumstances that no one could really foresee right and like how do you deal with it um yeah. it's it's interesting because there's been so many different things that have happened similar to that since then so like um i forget the name of the movie now alive was it called alive you know about the the soccer team that kind of gets uh, and columbia crashes into the andes yeah, or something and they, yeah. they have to eat people now they're dead already you know and, yeah. eating them. and then you hear of course about the donner party yeah um, and how there was, you know, rumors that they, they ate people and, and they all died eventually. But, you know, there's rumors around that. Yeah. There's books. Like, I read a book after I wrote The Starving. Now, this, I think, came out before The Starving, but I didn't read it until afterwards. called Hunger by Alma Katsu, who's another great horror writer. And she wrote it as in the Donner Party had a mm -hmm. Wendigo in the party. And that mm -hmm. kind of started putting them downhill. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and even the book or the movie Ravenous. Well, that's, yeah, uh, I was going to say, yeah, that's an amazing movie. I love that movie so much. It's one of my favorite it's, horror movies. It's a great movie. Went back and watched it recently, and it has all the old 90s, like, heavy metal guitar <laughs> in the soundtrack, which really kills it for me. Yeah. But it's still a pretty good movie. There's and still, the there's other... one, there's one part of the soundtrack. I, I, I know what you're talking about, but there's one part of the soundtrack that I thought was like, the, it was like this eerie, thing i think it's when they first like they're going out to try to find this party or whatever and, mm -hmm. and there's like this and they they kind of like play it again a couple more times but it's like mm -hmm. i hear that and it's like oh that's ravenous like there's no like yeah. it's so associated with it there's a another movie and i don't know you might actually want to pick, pick this up and watch it if you can find it uh cannibal the musical 
Oh, uh, yeah, I've heard of it from a few people. I still have not seen it yet. Uh, the guys from South Park. <laughs> yeah. It was one of their first movies. It's about the Donner Party. Yeah. And they, uh, <laughs> it's just, it's really funny. Um, yeah, I bet. And really goofy. And they, the whole story, the whole movie, I think, is based around one of the characters named Packer. His name is Packer, like his last name is Packer. Yeah. And at one point, one of the characters looks at him and he has like a piece of chocolate in his hand. And he's like, Fudge Packer? <laughs> and that is, that's the only reason they did that movie. I'm, I'm 100% certain. So it's puerile. It's so juvenile. So They're said to humor, man. Yeah. But I'm, I'm more than 100% sure that's the only reason they did that movie. Just yeah. to have that one little joke in there. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, so you're you're given a button that makes one piece of your work disappear as if it had never been written. It can be anything you've written. doesn't have to be published or not. What is it and why? It could be something that you just like put it tucked away in the drawer and you're like, that's never going anywhere. Um, I think a lot of writers can sympathize with me in terms of looking at their first published work and being kind of upset about it. Now it's not, I'm not talking about the starving. I'm still quite proud of the starving. Yeah. Um, but my first short story that was published in chillers from the rock. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. That's how bad it was. <laughs> but it had, it had Winston in it. Like it had the main character from the starving in it. Okay. And it was set in that world. But if I could, I would I would put that away. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I look at my first published work, The Yoga Strength, and I'm like, you know, I, I, I look, like, I think about it, and I'm just like, kind of like, you know, I don't, I don't think it's my best technically, like, technically, I don't think it's my best work by far. And, like, I have people read it, and they're like, oh, it's so great. And I'm like, kind of like, you know, I'm like, oh, man, like, just a little bit of cringe, you know, just kind of, <laughs> kind of like, yeah. which is, I think is a normal thing. I mean, I'd probably say it's got the most heart out of any work I've gotten because it was, like, my first book, and I put everything into it, right? But, um, yeah, yeah, I think that's common among writers. Their first book is kind of like, I don't know if you ever read uh I don't think it was Pratchett's first book, but The Color of Magic, the first, um, first, uh, whatchamacallit, um, Discworld book. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not in the same caliber as like the later stuff. No. Like there's no, there's no question. Yeah. No, and that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, okay. So The Risen, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm it was been a while since I read it, so I, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure there's a there's some weird witchcraft involved in that, if my mm -hmm. memory serves correctly. Yep. Um, what's your favorite witch story, and why? And what do you count as an influence on this story? Uh, Macbeth. Uh, Macbeth. Yeah, I can see the, that. Macbeth is actually the. I wanted to write Macbeth as a western. It's kind okay. of a kind of a common uh, thing for me is trying to rewrite things as westerns. Eh. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what that's where I took my influences from for this book, um, the Three Witches from Macbeth. Okay, uh, yeah, I can I see made that. one witch, but yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, I get you. Um, okay, here's one. Here's one that's a bit more fun. If you had any magic power, what would it be and why? Oh, I've had to go back to when I was like a kid thinking about this one. Yeah. Um, I think I would like. To be able to turn invisible, and not because I'm creepy and I want to sneak into you know <laughs> locker rooms or anything. Like porkies, that. Porkies yeah, part I don't want to do that. I, I think that it would be easier for me because I'm I'm a bit antisocial. I don't have like any diagnosis or anything, but I'm a bit of an antisocial person. Yeah, and it would also help me get some work done. <laughs> if, I, if I'm invisible, I can do some work. Uh, yeah, fair enough. You got you got kids too, so yeah, you probably probably go invisible every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, it's fun, yeah. Um, the Broken Spire. It's it's fantasy, but it's not like you know it's of its own. Like like I said, I think you've got a you've got a style of your own. And so, what's your favorite fantasy story, and why? And what? And 
um, what do you consider an influence on the Broken Spire? Uh, well, I mean, I love the Conan the Barbarian stuff. That's probably my favorite fantasy stuff, the pulpy kind of yeah. old school stuff. I also like the Kane books by Carl Edward Wagner. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, you know, Lord of the Rings with Tolkien. And I really liked uh, Harry Potter before I found out that J.K. Rowling's a turf. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd say the biggest influence that played on me would probably be uh, the, the Robert E. Howard stuff. Mm. I, think I, I really can see that. I, it definitely has a Samaria type of feel, that world you created. Yeah, yeah uh, that and D&D. &D. Yeah, fair enough. The, 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 one of the characters is based on a D&D &D character that I that I played. Okay, I Do you, so you used to play D&D, &D, eh? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, don't, don't play it currently? Uh, it's hard to do in the, in the pandemic, but um, there's always hope. I recently acquired um, an initial setup so I could start running it for my 15-year-old. Uh, um, yeah, okay. So I may start to run some games for him, but cool. uh, hopefully soon, once uh, once things get a little bit more under control, I can start getting back together with my group again, and, and we can do some more rolling dice. Yeah, we we picked up roll twenty during the pandemic, which was like basically video, not totally unlike this, but um, yeah, we were doing video. Uh, games it's not the same we went we had our first in-person game last friday in a long time and it's like you know i don't know what your experience of the pandemic has been but for me the isolation the it's not even like you know i kind of like time on my own but it's been just like the no, never-ending isolation and to have that that on the go again has been you know it's been great because you just I, I like people think i don't know um you know when we were growing up D D was like you know this like thing was like i don't know a ner super nerdy type of thing right like you can, like i couldn't think of anything more nerdy than D D. and now it's like you got you got celebrities playing D D on youtube and you know <laughs> not only not only nerdy but dangerous like people thought it was a gateway to satanism yeah yeah which is silly all around yeah um, like mazes and monsters did you do you remember that movie from uh, tom hanks was in it I, I I think I saw bits and pieces of. It. I know what it is though. It, yeah. Not a great movie, but it's yeah. basically saying that Dungeons and Dragons makes people crazy and they're going to try yeah. to people or themselves. It's really. It's like really a dare, crazy. don't do drugs video yeah. for D yeah. and yeah. for D and yeah. <laughs> D, yeah. D. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but yeah, the, the pandemic for me, I, I I keep saying it, and it's still kind of true. Um, again, I'm I'm just an antisocial person, so I've been okay, you know. Mm being home I, I got a pretty big family too right i mean i got yeah. three kids I got my wife uh, my parents have constantly been with us because of you know child care kind of stuff i've had to keep them in my bubble kind of thing and so you know i see i see my family i yeah. see and that's you know the biggest thing but i do miss seeing my friends more often uh, yeah. when the uh restrictions backed off a little bit a few months back now way before christmas yeah, I managed to get over and play some board games with a couple of friends, and that was that was awesome. That was a good yeah. day. Uh, yeah, it makes you appreciate these things we took for granted before the pandemic. Like, I, I appreciate them way more yeah, now. Exactly. Um, oh, this kind of brings me to the next question. Um, you can pick any fantasy race class person. So, uh, who who would you be? Um, so what would be your, uh, fantasy race class and person and what would you do? Like, what would be your, like, you know, I mean, I'm sure you've had characters over the years, but who would be the, who would be the one that you would live as if you had to choose one? All right. I'll give you two. One okay. is the character that I normally play and one is the character that I think I would be most comfortable in. So the first one is an orc or a half orc barbarian that's the yeah. one i always play as because i'm not original in the slightest um they're fun man and i'm just a yeah i'm a big dude i'm like six two, four hundred 400 pounds you know like i'm a big guy right so i like yeah. being big guy and that's that's what i know yeah right uh that kind of thing and it's fun to not have to think a whole lot you just oh i'm just gonna kill him you know that kind of thing <laughs> yeah to be able to do that. yeah uh, but the one that i would probably most likely be is just a human druid 
that can change into an animal. That would be okay. Fun. Yeah, yeah, I agreed. I'd always I always played as rogue characters that would like you know come out of the shadows and stab people. Although I, ever since I wrote this book, The Body Bird, I started playing as a bird, which has been fun. I mean, they're the crappiest from like a technical perspective characters <laughs> in the game, but they're fun. Yeah. Um, okay, so Ghost of Crimson Hall, I'm, I'm going to spoil it just a little bit and say there's Norse zombies in there, Draugr. Mm-hmm. What, what, in your idea, what in your mind makes the Draugr different than like a regular zombie? Uh... I think that the Draugr have purpose um, other than feeding, right? Like, mm-hmm. I think the story, they're more similar to ghosts, I think, in, like, the regular Norse mythology, right? Like, they're, but they're physical. Um, yeah. Like, they will, like, they'll haunt you. They'll come after you, that kind of thing. Whereas, it, like, zombies are just, you know, mindless wanting to eat. You know, I want to eat your yeah. brain, kind of thing. Yeah, but the Draugr can have intelligence. Now the Draugr in my book are a little bit different as well. Um, yeah, but yeah, like that would be probably be the biggest difference is that a Draugr can think. They're intelligent. I think they even helped fight battles in mytho- in the Norse mythology as well. Yeah, like they actually took up and not just being sent back from Valhalla or in Ragnarok or anything like that. Just they were there and they helped out sometimes. Around, so, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so your favorite zombie movie then, what would that be? Oh, this is hard. Um, yeah. There's so many good ones. Okay, I'll give you two. My favorite is Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. Because that is hilarious. But I think my favorite zombie movie, uh, just regular straight zombie movie, would be the... Zack Snyder, Dawn of the Dead, um, from early two thousands, I think. To that, yeah, I think it was two thousand four or yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's one of my favorites too. That's, uh, yeah, I've watched that so many times, mm-hmm. so many times, and like you know, I know that the original was like more of a political kind of like there was more meaning to it, like it, than that one. But that one is just like, in terms, of, like it's like I, it hit every single. Um, note perfectly for like a yeah. horror movie i think and and that's like my favorite movie but then you look at night of the living dead the original zombie yeah. movie right and you look at how groundbreaking it was at the time you know it had a black man as the protagonist yeah who was beating up white men yeah. not just zombie white men but white men you know yeah um it was just like I admire that one probably more than yeah. Dawn of the Dead, obviously. But I just really Dawn of the Dead was one of the first zombie movies I've seen, uh, like mm. you know, of that age kind of thing. Yeah. When zombie movies started getting really popular again. Yeah, and it just really you know spoke to me at the time, at yeah. that age, the age I was at when it came out. Yeah, one of the interesting things about that whole, excuse me, Night of the Living Dead saga was apparently Romero. Um, he worked with who was the guy? I think he the the I was, this is the guy who did the effects. I can't remember exactly who it was, but they had they had shared the like both of them had like a piece of the IP, mm-hmm. and they split it up. And Romero was going to take of the dead as like his movies, and then he was going to do um, Living Dead. This other guy, I can't remember who what mm-hmm. his name is. Anyways, buddy of mine. He told me to check out, like I'd never seen it, check out The Return of the Living Dead. And that movie, like, it's great. But the opening sequence before the title plays is probably the best one I have ever seen. It's so friggin' hilarious. And, like, you're not expecting it. <laughs> I, like, I couldn't. It was, like, yeah, it's it's worth it just to watch the opening sequence. Uh, you know, there's movies out there that were... Uh, popular when i was like maybe a little bit too young to be watching them or like just as i was getting older and i just never bothered to watch them Mm. like that's one of them yeah uh uh, return of the living dead i really i've been searching for that i can't find it anywhere yeah Um, it's uh i had to rent it on apple because i couldn't like i couldn't like so i paid the five bucks or whatever but it's 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 really worth it it's like a comedy comedic like 
punk rock zombie movie and the yeah, second right. one's great too the two of the first two are great the third one's kind of iffy but and that's I thought, the only one you can find anywhere on yeah i know <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh yeah i i i, I thought it was because it used to come on like showcase or something like that i'd mm-hmm. see it there and it'd be like uh that's like like crappy b like because they, they made like so many sequels and then it was like number five or six and you knew they were like the straight to video trash that you just like yeah you get, you, anyway, so I, I avoided it like the plague, but anyways, it's it's uh, it's worth the watch. The um, last question I have for you, John, before we uh, sign off, because we're just about an hour there. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> a friend of yours, total horror virgin, has never even heard of Stephen King. What book do you recommend and why? Or, and I'm talking about horror entirely, the genre. It could be mm-hmm. Poe, could be anyone. And, and any work. Think of that one. There's uh, my initial response is to say Salem's Lot because it's a bit of an easier building because it's vampires, right? And it's yeah. there, but it's a brick of a book. Yeah. And so if you're getting someone new in that, you may not. They may not like it. I would say I want to go out there and say um, Carrie. It's okay. A small book. It's yep. a horror. It's Stephen King's first book. Yeah. Um, my 15 year old started reading it a couple of years ago. He still hasn't finished it yet because, you know, 15 year olds. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's easy enough to get into. Uh, gives you an idea of the kind of style you're looking for. And it's not super scary either. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, okay. I'm going to uh, call it there. Um, but first, before we go, I kind of. I'm just going to reread. So your the books you've got out um, novels: The Starving, The Risen, The Broken Spot, or and Ghost of Crimson Holland, Hollow is a novella. Yeah. Through Raven, was it Raven? Raven Tale. Raven Tale. T A L E. T A L E. Um, and if people want to look you up on the net, what's your what's the best place they can find you? Um, I'm constantly on Twitter, so at Dobbin John J O N. Um, find me there a lot. Uh, I do have an author page on Facebook, John Dobbin dash author, and uh, I have a Goodreads author page as well. Okay, perfect. That's J O N. Just just make yep. sure everyone knows. Yeah. J O N D O B B I N. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much, John, and uh, thanks for being the first guest on Holy Flamingo Poop, my new uh, <laughs> my new podcast. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, you know, I'm gonna put the put the link to this podcast and some little blurb about your work in my next newsletter. It's coming out on March the first, and this podcast is probably gonna launch just before then. So, awesome. all right, perfect. Thanks, man. Hopefully, we can do this again sometime. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, take it easy, buddy. Bye. Bye.